Dr. Anuja Jingren is a professor of radiation oncology at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in, in Texas. She's a specialist in gynecologic uh, malignancies, really a, a world-renowned expert, and so we're very lucky to have her here today to talk about some considerations when contouring G various GYN uh, malignancies. We won't be able to cover every single GYN subsite today, so uh, we had asked her to pick a couple that she thought were the highest yield, specifically with a focus on you know which areas benefited the most from IMRT. If, for those of you that weren't able to attend uh, the lecture earlier this week, this is now kind of kicking off the, uh, the clinical section on our transition from 3D radiation to IMRT radiation for, for our curriculum that we're running. The medical physicists, as you know, are attending some other sessions, and we have a special curriculum just for physicians. We've sent out a Google link, uh, or sorry, Google Calendar that has all of this, the sessions listed in it to all of the administrators at your sites. And so hopefully they've distributed that to you. But if anyone uh, ha hasn't received that, we can provide that link again here in, in the chat so that you can see the, the upcoming sessions and there'll also be other email reminders. Finally, before I turn it over, I just wanted to, to touch base on what we'll be doing after this lecture. So each each clinical topic that we're going to be covering over the next month, which starts out with uh, GYN, then later next week, pediatrics, then the week after, prostate, and then the week after that, a head, and, a head and neck contouring curriculum. Each of these are designed to be interactive in that what we're going to ask your sites to do is, you know, is to upload a case that you contoured in that disease uh, section to a remote contouring platform called Prono. And we've sent instructions for how to do this to all of your site coordinators, uh, your clinical coordinators, so that either you or uh, your medical physicists can upload patients, act the actual DICOM files to this software so that we can then review some of your contours of, of cases when we do the follow-up session each after each, each lecture. The one for this one will be on, on Tuesday next week. So more information hopefully should have been uh, given to you as well from your, your clinical co your, your coordinators at your at your site as we put together some instructions for that as well. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jingren. And uh, certainly if you have questions, as she said, either jump in or just type them in the chat box and I can, I can interrupt her. Thank you. I'm going to stop my video just because I'm going to be showing my slides and you don't need to see me. Okay, so I'm stopping my video. Let's see if I can make the slides work though. Aha, uh -huh. yes. Great. Okay, can you see my slides? Uh, yes, but all of them. Um, Dr. Jingren, I think you have it. In a, I think it might you might be sharing a different screen because I can see both the current slide and the next slide. Okay, so let me. You might need stop. to share the other screen. Sometimes this happens. To me. Or if you click uh, switch this presentation one? mode or switch view mode. That, that is that better? I think that's it. That, I think that's it. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Click share screen one more time. Share screen. I'm going to click this. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So when we do the contouring session. Okay. So we're going to start off with cervix. And actually, okay. <laughs> so we're going to start off with cervix. But what I'm going to talk about in cervix is very related to endometrial. And some of it's going to go to and to vagina as well as to vulvar. But we are going to do a separate session on vulvar. But I, said I was going to do some slides first, and then if we have time, I'm actually going to show you some cases. But we'll see if we have time or not, but hopefully we will. Okay. All right. Maybe. Here we go. Okay. So what do we know? What are we worried about, right? So, and this is for all gynecological cancers, right? The nodes that we really are worried about are the pelvic nodes and the parotid nodes, right? So there's going to be the parotids, the commons, the pericycles, internal iliacs, external iliacs, obturator, and inguinals. So these are the most important things. So let's just kind of go over here. Okay, so what is important? What is important is that we need to know a couple of things. The first thing we need to know is that cervix cancer, and I cannot tell you this more than anything else, cervix cancer is very orderly, okay? So what cervix cancer does is, I'm gonna go back here, right? Sorry. What cervix cancer does is it goes in an orderly way. It will have 
positive pelvic nodes first, and pelvic nodes include common iliac nodes before it goes to the periodics. So you cannot have a cervix cancer that has positive periodic nodes if it doesn't have pelvic nodes that are positive. So they could have positive common iliac nodes and then go to the periodics, but they will never have a positive periodic node unless there is something positive in the pelvis. So if you do not, if you see a positive periodic node in a cervix cancer and you think there's, and there's nothing in the pelvis, then you're missing it. So it's really important to make sure that you pay very important, very careful attention to this because cervix cancer will not go to the periodics unless there is some positive node in the pelvis. That's key. Versus endometrium. Endometrium has a 10 to 15% incidence of high having positive periodic nodes without having positive pelvic nodes. Okay, so this brings up that whole debate about sentinel nodes because we inject the cervix for even endometrium, right? So we're getting the cervical cancer nodes, but are we missing the fundal nodes, which are the periodic nodes? Yeah, it's about 10 to 15%, but we decided that we were going to take that risk. So in endometrial cancer, they can go to the periodic nodes, but a thing is, and you kind of know this anatomy, right? If there's gross fundal involvement, those are the patients who have the highest risk to go to the periodic nodes without going to the pelvis nodes, okay? So it has to be gross fundal involvement, and that's how they go to the periodic nodes. Other thing I need you guys to know which isn't on here. So let's go back to cervix cancer, right? If you have gross periodic nodes, what is the next area that you have to worry about in cervix cancer? Like I have actually several patients, and I'm going to be honest with you, we have kind of changed it. I have patients that have gross periodic nodes, right? What do I worry about? I worry about the thoracic duct draining into the left supraclass. Right? So if there really is gross periodic nodes and they're bulky, you really do have to worry about the left supraclass. What I've done is either treat it prophylactically or in this last case, because she had so much disease, I actually did an ultrasound to make sure it was negative and we're just going to watch it. But do need to know if there is bulky periodic nodes in cervical cancer, there is a high incidence of having left superclav nodes thanks to the thoracic duct. Okay, just, just, just an idea, okay, just a thought. All right, so let's talk about IMRT, and I know you guys have already heard this, but I'm just going to go over this because we're going to go over this 100 times, right? What's GTV? GTV is gross tumor volume. It is the volume that you're going to see either by PET or by MRI or by CT, so that's the gross disease. CTV is going to be your clinical target volume, and I think this is so important because I think, and this is just the way I practice, but you can practice however you want, and we've seen, I've seen a lot of ways to do it. I always contour a CTV, okay? I always contour an area that's for my microscopic disease. That's what CTV is. CTV is all the area that your microscopic disease will be. So I always contour a CTV, and then I put a PTV on it. This way, I know for sure that I am covering the area that I want to cover, right? So here in this slide, you can see, here's the gross, here's the node, right? The yellow is your CTV. So it's covering the whole nodal bed that I think my microscopic disease is going to be. I always contour this. This is so important. Otherwise, I'm going to miss disease, right? Then, you, then I add a PTV, and that's up to you to decide how much PTV you want. And all that depends on what type of imaging you have, right? If you're doing daily imaging, you can do 5 to 7 millimeters PTV. But if you're not, and you're not doing imaging at all, then you have to probably add a CM, right? And what is PTV? PTV is the margin that you need to make sure that the patient's set up correctly, inter fraction or intra, interfraction or inter movement in between, not blanking, but in between, you know, just set up. So PTV is really important, but it is completely related to what type of imaging you're going to be doing on the patient. So 
at Anderson, we always do seven millimeters PTV because we only do daily KV. So we're just looking at bony landmarks. A lot of people will do five millimeters PTV because they're doing a CT every day. So the PTV is really related to what kind of imaging you're going to be doing every day. So how do we cover nodes? What you want to do is you want to cover the blood vessels because that's where the nodes are going to be, right? So, but you, you want to carry, cover the area around the blood vessels, not just the blood vessels. That's important because the nodes are going to be right around that area, right? So let's go to parotics. As I mentioned, parotics. What, what tumor drains to the parotics? The uterine th fundus, fallopian tubes and ovaries, and then if you have common iliacs. Okay, when you are simulating the patient with periodics, you're going to have to have your, the arms up because arms have to be outside of uh, above the field. So here is just and this is just an atlas showing you how to contour the periodics. Again, what we talked about, you want to cover the blood vessels, but you can't just contour the blood vessels, right? Because the node isn't in the blood vessel. The node is around the blood vessels. So your CTV, and I, I, know, I know this is hard to see here, but it's this teal, but your CTV, and you can see my arrow going around, your CTV is covering the area around your blood vessels. Okay, and as we get further down, you want to make sure you cover the renal vessels, but you don't need to cover this vein up here. But as you go further down, then you do need to inc include the vein there, right? So, you, But you can see it's the area around the vessels is your CTV. You do want to get off the duodenum. You don't need to include the ureters, but you want to get close to the psoas muscle as possible because your nodes are going to be down here, right? So you want to get to the psoas muscle as you go down. So as you can see, here's the vein, here's the aorta. We're going around and we're covering that area. This is, this is where my nodes are going to be. Further down, again, ureter, ureter, psoas muscle, you're covering that area. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is your CTV, not your PTV, your CTV. So you go down, again, psoas muscle. My CTV goes to both of my psoas muscles, not including the ureter. But your PTV will cover the ureter because it's going to be seven millimeters, but I'm off my bone, right? I'm off the psoas muscle. I'm off of as much of the normal tissue as possible. And then I will add a PTV to this. Questions? Anybody have questions so far? Okay, so we're gonna go to the next slide. Um, Anusha, I had one question in the chat. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned you start contouring the aorta and then eventually you'll start to include the IVC as well. When do you make that transition? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And as you can see, it's probably right around the L2, right? Do you see it's L1, L2? It is when it gets, closer to the to the bone, right? So here you can see where it's way far away. Now, this is different than GI, right? GI, you're going to have that all included. It's really interesting because I get my patients, I mean, my residents who come in from GI service to GYN, and GI, you have to cover this, right? You have to cover it up here. But in GYN, until it gets close enough to the bone, and it usually is right between L1 and L2, so as it gets closer into by the aorta, that's when we start including it. It's really right by the kidneys. It's really, as you get to the kidneys, then you're going to start including it. But higher up, you don't because really, again, for cervix cancer, it usually goes to the left side. And for endometrial especially, this is where the highest risk for a periodic is. It's right underneath the left renal vein. Okay, and you've got to make sure you give enough margin, especially for endometrial, to be right underneath the left renal vein. But the left side is really the most common. So they will recur, they will occur on the right side, but really the most common is on the left. But it is right as we get closer to the kidneys that I will start including the vein. Okay. Okay. So again, this is the periodic. So now, so you can see where I am right next to the kidneys, right? And actually, you can see where this kidney actually has some hydro. 
But then here we are including the vein. So by the time you get to the kidneys, you're including the vein, right? So here's your CTV. Here's your duodenum. So we are not including the duodenum in my CTV. Now remember, because that is just the bed, right? So I am not, there is no PTV involved in this because I will add a PTV to it. I mean, I think I just need to reemphasize that because I do see a lot of people that make their CTV very big and then they add a PTV and then you're treating the entire normal tissue. But again, draw the correct CTV and you can add whatever PTV you want depending on what type of imaging you're doing, right? And your worry, what your worry is about the patient setup. But the CTV should really be as accurate and as as you can be. So just just some things. So the for the periodics, this is for bony landmarks. When we're not really kind of using these bony landmarks anymore, but in the old days, when you were covering periodics, you need to go to the top of L. T12. Um, T12. Nowadays, it's really above the renal vessels. As long as you go above the renal vessels, so you have to go above, not at the renal vessels, but above the renal vessels to include all your periodics. Okay, so bony landmark, top of T12, new above the renal vessels. Okay, and again, you know, and we don't use this anymore, right? We're contouring my CTV. So we aren't looking at transverse processes. That's what we used to do in the old days. We don't do that now. So common iliac. What what cancer patients what cancers go to the common iliac? Again, we've talked every cancer in the GYN tract will go to the common iliac except vulva. And vulva will only go to the common iliac if there is positive pelvic, external, or internal iliacs. So know that vulva also is very symptomatic. It, uh, it's systematic, and I'm going to go through that in a minute, but it does go through inguinals, then it goes to obturators, then it goes to external iliac, internal iliac, and then it will go to common iliac. So, But the cervix can directly go to the common iliacs without involving the external and internal iliac. It's rare, but it can. So just know that, but the vagina also, as well as fallopian tubes, and then as you know, if you do have external iliac and internal iliacs, the common iliacs always are going to be your next step, okay? So, in the, and I'm going to show you some data, but what are your borders for common iliac? It really is the aorta bifurcation, okay? That's key. It used to be good L4, or L5, you're going to be covering it. I'm going to show you data that's not correct. So the border really is the aorta. The superior border is really the aortic bifurcation. And you really need to go to the aortic bifurcation to make sure you're covering the entire common iliac chain. And that is so important for any intact cervix. And I just I cannot reemphasize this. As soon as we started doing that, we have had very few recurrences above the field. So we always go to the uh, top of the um, aortic bifurcation. That is now the new recommendations. And the key is you do want to avoid bleeding vertebral bodies because you can have an underdose. This was a, a case of a patient who they did try to avoid splitting the vertebral bodies, and they ended up with have a recurrence right in the middle of the um, field. But here's your CTV. Now, this is a, probably a more generous CTV than I would do. Just letting you know, I, so here's the issues, right? So let's talk about issues with this field, right? I think the CTV is too big. This is what is from the Atlas, so you'll see it from the Atlas, right? This is actually a picture from the Atlas, but I personally would not go so far into the bow because this is my CTV, right? The node isn't going to be up there. So I usually just cover right above the vessels. Again, this is involving some of the psoas, so I'm going to go right here right, and then go around, and again, a little bit of so. So it's a little bit more generous. There's nothing wrong with the CTV. This is probably okay. It's just a little bit more generous than I would do, but I would not, I mean, this would not hurt the patient. But do realize, this is your CTV, right? So if you're going to do a CM or a 7 millimeter PTV, then you're covering all that bow, right? So you just have to look and see. It's important to look and see. So let's, we were talking about the aortic bifurcation and common iliacs, right? So in the old days when we were looking at bony landmarks, we really did say L4, L5 because we thought that was where the aortic bifurcation was and that was really covering the um, 
all of the common iliacs. Well, we have actually did a study at MD Anderson looking at where the aortic bifurcation is, and we found that it was actually very, very variable, and it really isn't just at L4, L5. It's probably actually a little bit higher. And actually, this just sh slide shows you where all the different places where the aortic bifurcation can be. Most commonly, it is at L4, L5, right? But it can be above it as well. So we do go above the aortic bifurcation as the top of our, our field. So we contour up to the aortic bifurcation. I'm just going to let you guys know, you know, we've put in auto contouring for our nodes now, and the auto contouring goes to the aortic bifurcation. I mean, that's just so important. So sacral nodes. What drains to the sacral nodes? Really, the cervix drains to the sacral nodes. And I just, so this slide is actually probably wrong. The cervix really drains to the to the sacral nodes. So for uterus, for endometrial cancer, if there is cervical stromal involvement, then it drains to the sacral nodes, so you have to cover it. But for endometrial, if it, there is no cervical involvement, then you do not need to cover the sacral nodes, okay? Now, I, and it's okay not to, I've seen patient people, a lot of people who don't treat the sacral nodes at all for endometrial, we usually go to S2 for endometrial, but it is okay not to, so that's totally your decision. But cervix and upper vagina definitely drain to the sacral nodes. We usually go now, and this is also a debate, right? Embrace says to go to S2. I think that's two for intact cervix, and Embrace protocol says S2, contour to S2. For I think that's too little because the cervix really does go to the sacral nodes, and we have seen recurrences right here. Right, so we always cover to S3, and the you know, and if you remember, your four fields or your APPA actually cover the entire sacrum. However, we don't. I mean, you want to cover the uteral sacral ligament, right? So, I, you know, we cover to S3, and we are very comfortable in covering to S3 because that way we know we're covering all the sacral nodes. But embrace does say go to S2, so there is big debate about that, but. You know, as long as you, for cervix, as long as you're at least going to S2, you're okay. I personally would go to S3, and that's what we do at MD Anderson. So this is from the Atlas, which I'm going to give you the website, right? And actually, it's really interesting, just FYI, um, Embrace is asking you to do it just like this, which is <laughs> very hard. So you literally have to contour each station for embrace, right? So what are our, what are our nodes right here, right? So here's your external iliac, your internal iliac, and your sacral. And the thing that we have changed, and I think it's going to show, sorry, I'll go back. What we have shown, what we have changed in the atlas, that is, and I'm going to send you the website, is you got to go for your sacral nodes, just like for GI, you got to go to two to three CMs above the sacral notch to cover your nodes. I usually, and I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the vessels right here. I usually go right above the vessels, right? Do you see those vessels right there? I make sure that I cover those vessels because that's where your node's going to be. But you got to make sure you're at least two to three CMs above the sacrum. To, so that's your CTV. Okay, that is important. That was something we left out in the original atlas that we have added to this atlas because people were failing, right? So you got to make sure you got enough margin right here. But you can see where the vessels and I go right above that. Again, this is a little bit old school because this is talking to you about bony landmarks. I'm going to tell you we don't use bony landmarks, so I'm not going to. It's really important to know that, but let's just go step by step on where you are and what, and uh, let me know if you can't see it, but you want, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you go right to the psoas, you want to cover all the vessels, right? You want to have one to two CMs here, and then you want to go up and cover all the vessels, right? Probably the ureter is in this, and, and down here, you are going to get the ureter into your CTV, Okay. So higher up, you don't have the ureter in your CTV, but as you go lower down, you are going to have the ureter in your CTV, okay? So this is an S2. As we go higher up, again, you can see this is even, because you want to cover that vessel, right? So this is even more than two to three CMs, but you got to make sure you cover that sacral hollow. And like I said, I usually cover those vessels. So look how deep this is, right? And again, psoas, make sure you got the psoas. And as I said, we don't put the CTV in the psoas. You can see we just go right around the psoas and we make sure we're covering all those vessels because the node is going to come right here, 
key, right? And now we're going higher up, and we're actually almost to the aortic bifurcation. But again, going around, you po you do have the ureter up here in the field, and here's the psoas. Now here, she is including the – this person is uh, Dr. Eiffel and Dr. Klopp who did this – are including the ureter in this. You could make it a little bit – less lateral, but not by much, okay? But the ureter definitely is in this one, okay? So as you go, you know, and then as you go higher up, you're going to get off the ureter. So external and internal iliac, we've kind of talked about, but the drainage to the external and inter internal iliac is everything. Everything drains to the external and internal iliac. And as you can see, you can see where th the um, bifurcation is right here. You want to make sure you're covering you're away from the psoas, you're covering, you're away from the bone. You want to make sure you have two CMs right here, and it's just going down. And I'm happy to send you these slides. But you can see as we go down, you want to cover the vessels, right, and the nodal area, because the nodes are going to occur right here, right there. Okay, and you can see here the ureter is in the way, but you're off the bowel. Don't put, you don't need to put your CTV into bowel. Sorry. This is what happens when I have – you don't need to put your CTV into bowel. Do you see how we're just going right around it, but we're covering that nodal bed, right? That's important. So, again, external, internal iliacs. Okay, now, this is an interesting thing. So, I want – okay, I do want us to look at this because this is something – Maybe it's a little bit more unique to MD Anderson, so I want us to talk about this a little bit. So what we do at MD Anderson, and you're going to see a little bit different than in the Atlas, right? So as you're going down, now you're at the obturator level, right? And then you're going to go into your inguinals, right? So if you're not – so you're to treat just the external and internal iliacs, you can see where this is still – so as you get to the flat plate of the femoral head and you see the vessels going lateral, right, through the inguinal canal. See this here? It's the, and that's hard to – trust me, I never can see this. It's one, <laughs> I always like to see when my vessels go lateral, right? So you can see where my vessels are going lateral, then I come off. Now the atlas says to go ahead and just still go there. Advantages and disadvantages. The Disadvantage is you really are going to be treating a lot more bone, especially the femoral head and that neck area, right? And you're also going to get dose if the patient's the skinniest here, so you're going to get a lot more dose to the skin. So we, we really do at Anderson, when we get close to this flat part, but key is you see the inguinal canal, but when the vessels are starting to go lateral through that canal, we'll get off if we're not worried about the inguinals. Okay, so you can see where we're getting off, but it's so important. And this is the other thing that we added to the atlas that we forgot last time, okay, is to make sure you continue down and cover the obturator area up to the symphysis, okay? That is important. I actually had a cervix cancer, and it's so sad. I had a patient who failed right here. Okay, so it is, and this is the one thing we did forget in the original atlas was we didn't have the sacral nodes correctly contoured and we forgot the obturator nodes. You've got to cover that obturator space all the way to the symphysis. Very, very important. But you can see we're not covering the inguinals, right? So this is a little bit, I mean, there's nothing wrong with still going out here, but eventually, you, as you can see, you're going to go down. It just does treat a little bit more tissue. So we do get off of it. So obturator space, like I said, I've emphasized this over and over again. Uterus, cervix, vagina, and vulva, because vulva is not here. Very important. Cover it all the way to the symphysis. The borders are the obturator internal muscles, inferiorly top of symphysis, the pubic symphysis. That's key. So you want to cover that obturator space. All, so this is wrong on this side. I would have had this obturator space covered right, up to the symphysis. You've got to cover that obturator space. So again, just showing you, in fact, this is exactly what Embrace wants, but it shows you the different um, stations. You want to make sure you're covering all the stations, but you can see 
it really covers the space and so not just the vessels, but you got to, and I've seen this where people miss the mistakes I see. So I'm going to tell you the mistakes I see because I review a lot of patient uh, contours from other, they'll miss this, right? They'll miss that external iliac. They'll just cover this. And it's important that you do cover all of it, right? The external, internal, and obturators, all of this needs to be covered. So you do go to the muscle, but you don't need to cover the muscle. You don't need to go to the bone. You don't need to cover the muscle here, right? But you got to cover all. You've got to make sure you get all these vessels in. So you've got to make sure you have space over there. Oh, well, we may not be getting to my contouring, but I did have it. Okay. Just going down again, just showing you as we go lower down. So here, MD Anderson would have done something different, right? So this is from the Atlas. But what we would have done different here is we would probably just have, see my arrow? We would have probably stopped and gone in. So we wouldn't have gone so lateral. But as I said, this is fine and most people do this. We wouldn't have. We would have just stopped here, but that's okay. And inguinals, okay? And I'm going to go through inguinal contouring actually in detail when we go to the vulva. So just be patient with me. Just, But let's just talk about it real quick. But I'm actually going to go through this whole slide again. But inguinal nodes, we know. When do you treat the inguinal nodes? This is important, though. And you have to know this, okay? Vulva, you treat the inguinal nodes. Direct drainage, that's the primary drainage for vulva. The other time that you're going to treat the inguinal nodes, unless they're positive, is if you have one-third distal vaginal disease, okay? So if your cervix cancer goes all the way down to the distal one-third, that you include the inguinals. I would, you know, I, that's what we use, but you could even use the distal one-fourth, right? We use the distal one-third, but you can use the distal one-fourth. You're going to have to treat the inguinals. If you have a vaginal case that involves the distal lower one-third, you're going to include the inguinals. So it's important. What the other thing to know, and I know you're probably not going to see a whole lot of this, but we do see this a lot, is a patient who had a port recurrence in the anterior abdominal wall, or if you ha if they had a recurrence in their C-section scar, their um, hysterectomy scar, those patients will drain to the inguinal node. So you may need to treat the inguinal nodes prophylactically. It's just a thought, and uh, you know, just thinking about it. If you are going to treat the inguinal nodes, you really should frog leg these patients because then you can spare the thigh. But I do know some of the, the problem with frog legging is then you have to worry about positioning and making sure the patient is in accurate position every time. So the advantage of frog legging is you have to spare, especially if you're not treating the vulva and you're not treating anything else, you spare the thighs and you spare the vulva. The disadvantage of frog legging is it is very hard to reposition. For the inguinal, superiorly is the inguinal ligament, inferior lateral is the intratocanter line, and I, to be honest, okay, you guys, this is important too, because I see my residents do this all the time, and I end up having um, to take slices off. I, the inguinals really do end, unless says positive notes, they end right here, right, in this inter, do not go past this. Once you're going past this, you're treating the femoral nodes, you don't need to treat the leg nodes, all that is going to do is increase lymphedema. So see, it's really important not to go too low. There is always, I mean, I know, you know, you always think, okay, let's just treat more and more is always better than less, but that's not true. I mean, the whole reason why you're doing IMRT versus doing 3D is you're trying to save toxicity. So if you're trying to t save toxicity, more is not always better than less. What's important is you treat it accurately, right? So you cover the areas accurately, not more or less. Just make sure you cover the areas accurately. So we really do go right to the trochanter, right? So that's really our bottom edge. And then your PTV is going to go a little bit further than that. Superior lateral is the anterior inferior iliac spine. And distally is, like I said, the less, lesser trunk ridge. So right there. So inferior lateral, you go right to here. Superior lateral, anterior inferior iliac spine, and then distal is the lesser trochanter, which is really where we go, okay? So what are some common mistakes? And I've already kind of talked to you about a lot of the common mistakes. And again, like I said, I review a lot of cases, so it's important to, I see a lot of common mistakes. And it isn't just residents, right? It's senior um, staff members who just don't have enough experience in treating um, IMRT or just don't, just make mistakes because you, you miss Right? So key, 
you don't want to just cover, right, we've already talked about, don't cover just the muscles. I mean, just the vessels. you got to cover the area around the vessels, right? Don't include the bone, right? All that's going to do is increase when you add that PTV, more bone, you're treating a lot more bone marrow. And most of these patients are going to get chemotherapy, then you're affecting their bone marrow, right? So you don't really need to treat the psoas unless the psoas is involved. Again, you're going to have PTV on there. Key, so draw the CTV accurately and add whatever PTV you want, just depending on your imaging. Other, and this is the key thing we've changed for our atlas, you've got to cover the pre-cycles. And you can see, you can see the vessels. See these vessels? You want to go right above it. That's so important, okay? Because this is where a patient's going to fail, and you're going to be so sad. So here's some... Guidelines, this is for the intact cervix, already been published, and I think we'll send it to you online. Great guideline to draw intact cervix if you want. The other thing that's really good is the Embrace. Embrace has a, on the web, they have how they contour everything, so it's, it's also a great resource. And just per and I'm not going to go through this because we really want to talk about nodal, but you know the perimetrium, which we don't contour. This is an MRI, and I'm going to be honest. I don't really contour. I do contour the per, um, perimetrium when I do intact cervix, but it's a little bit more difficult and harder to do. And I could tell you how we do it, but I'm not sure that it's in the preview of this talk because doing what I what we do, and just to let you know, we don't contour the perimetrium separately. And I was going to show you an intact cervix case that I have contoured to show you how I do contour it. And I'm not sure if I'm going to have time, but key is we do a big CTV, right? So that will cover all of this area. So we're not contouring the perimetrium separately. We're covering everything. And I may, even if we don't, I may just show it to you real quick on what we, how we contour that, okay? But, you know, you do need to know the borders, which is anterior is bladder, posterior is perirectal fascia, medial is tumor, and cervix rim, and laterally is the pelvic wall, right? So you got to make sure you cover all the way to the pelvic wall. You got to make sure you get all these vessels. See those vessels? You got to, and you can see them even on CT. And I wanted to show it to you on CT, right? So you got to just make sure that, and I will show it to you. The other thing is if you got to make sure you cover the uteral sacral ligament, especially post-op, and you can see this. And this is where, you know, your CTV needs to come down here. And that's why I cover this whole fat area right here. So if I'm doing, so I go all the way across straight. I don't try to save the rectum. I actually go straight across, okay? I am going to try to show you that. Again, the vagina, it's pretty easy. Key is, you, I, let me, so this is wrong. And I, oh, this is wrong or right. It depends. This is what we do. So we include at least three cm of the vagina or at least one cm of the optoroid above the optoroid or foramen, okay? So that is how we contour the vagina. Again, Embrace says only two cm of the vagina, and they're not going, they're not putting much PTV inferiorly because they're trying to decrease vaginal toxicity. And they say, they say they've seen no failures. So that's the difference, Okay. At Anderson, we still do at least three CMs of the vagina or at least one CM or one CM above the obturator foramen. And I have to say, most of the time, this is the key. We go one CM of the obturator foramen. That was what we included in our, you know, four fields. Is it too much? Probably. I don't think we're at that comfort level yet as embraces. The patients that we will put on Embrace will do what they asked us to do, but I have to say I'm not sure we're at that comfort level. So uh, this is just uh, from the atlas, and, you'll, and we'll, I'm going to give you that sign. Is So here's the vagina, right? So you are – now this is probably a little bit tighter CTV than I would do for the vagina. We always do an ITV, so we always do a scan with an empty and a Full, and we contour the vagina from both of those scans, which means that I will definitely, my CTV will go more into the bladder, and my CTV would probably go more into the rectum, okay? And then, as I said, this is the space. Make sure you cover that space. And I just can't re-emphasize it over and over again. Just lower down again. This is probably a little bit tighter than I would do. It is in the atlas. I don't know how I got away with the atlas, but I would have, I would personally have more up in the bladder and more, and a little bit more in the rectum. But again, you can see, obturator, vagina.
and I've talked to talked and whoever did see my talk on Monday knows about this variation in vaginal cuff. The cuff can move two to four cm's, two to four cm's. Sorry, I'm just just one second. I'm getting I'm getting a call from I just two seconds. I'm getting a physician who getting a call from a physician. So just give me one minute, and I'm going to be right back at to you. So I do apologize. All right. Okay, sorry. The vagina can move two to four cm's depending on both bladder or rectal filling. Okay, so this shows you the change in the vagina due to rectal filling, and this shows you the change in vagina due to bladder filling. Okay, so we always do full and empty. We do not empty the rectum as as I've mentioned before to people is in prostate. They do do empty the rectum prior to each simul each treatment. We don't because our patients are eventually going to have diarrhea anyway. So we will compensate. So in this case, my my uh, you can't see it. Sorry, let me go back. My vaginal contour would go into the bladder and it would go into the rectum, right? So I would have covered this whole area. That would be my entire CTV here, right? Because that rectum will be different. But you've got, so we always do a full and empty. So we will make sure that we have this as my seat, my ITV. Okay. I'm talking fast. I do apologize. And I am running out of time. So I'm going to need more time for this. <laughs> Maybe we could do another session. Because um, I really did want to show you. Go over, it's, it's okay. I mean, if people have to yeah. leave, we're recording the session. I don't know what yeah. your ability is. That my problem is I have a consult at 11, but I, I am sad. And I may do just do this and then show you a couple of cases instead of going over vulva. But let's talk. I mean, I don't know what y'all want to do. Anyway, so let's just talk a little bit more, okay? So how about uterus? Again, I showed this in on t Monday, but the uterus can move as well. Just FYI, the uterus moves quite a bit. And this just shows you it moves because of bladder filling. But it can also move backwards and forwards, right? So it could go front and it could go retroverted, right? And so I do want to show you, and I and I am going to show it to you how I contour, we contour our uteruses, okay? Because you've got so, so basically you have to cover all of this, even if you're doing a comb beam, daily comb beam, you've got to cover all of that. But know that the uterus is going to move depending on your bladder filling and your bladder empty. Okay, as well as retroverted versus introverted, right? They're going to move while you're treating, and it will shrink. So you've got to know all of this. And this just shows you what it looks like when you're contouring. This is a post-op patient. Just, and again, this is your four field, which we're not going to talk about because you guys already know that. So we're going to skip this. Um, I did want to talk a little about, bit about dosing because I think dosing is important, but I know that you guys already have heard it. But I just want to just an thoughts 45 gray we usually go to 45 gray and i've had this question from so many people that i know from africa right so we always go to 45 gray i do know in africa you guys tend or i don't know if everybody's from africa but in africa they tend to, and they tend to go to 50 gray and there's nothing wrong with going to 50 gray Right, especially for it. So this is more for intact cervix. So let's talk about intact cervix. We always go to 45 gray for our microscopic disease. I know in a lot of um, countries they actually go to 50 gray. Embrace tells you not to go to 50 gray. Embrace actually goes to 45 too. I don't think there's anything wrong in going to 50 gray. So please know that. I also know that you guys have more advanced disease than we do. The issue with going to 50 gray for intact cervixes is that you're limiting the dose that you can give with your brachytherapy, especially because you're at 50 or due to the rectum, and you're 50 to the sigmoid, and you're 50 to the bladder, right? Yes, I think the advantage of going to 50 is then you don't have to do the parametrial boost. The disadvantage of not doing the parametrial boost is then you're treating everything to 50, okay? So the other question I get a lot from everybody is, do you always do parametrial boost? So just to let you know that I don't always do parametrial boost. So if I have a patient who has parametrial involvement initially, if there is no parametrial involvement by the time I do brachytherapy, I will not, and that is the recommendation by ABS, do a parametrial boost. 
So the movement has been a, is to get away from the perimetrial boost. The old protocols always said if you had to be disease, you had to do a perimetrial boost. No longer. Okay. So if you examine a patient at the time of brachytherapy and there's no perimetrial involvement, you don't have to do a boost. So a, the advantage of 45 gray is that my bladder, my rectum, and my sigmoid have only gotten 45. So I can give a higher dose with my brachytherapy. I mean, those are just thoughts that I need you guys to know. Now, lymph nodes, again, there's a difference in philosophy. The goal, though, is to get an EQD2 of at least 60. All my periodics, I do take to 60. My pelvic nodes, I usually take to 66 because I can get away with it. Okay. For you that I found very valuable in terms of thinking about contouring for each of these different sites. Are you able to see my screen? Fantastic, all right. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this is just a background overview of everything we'll attempt to cover during the next hour or so thinking about uh, a little bit of the background for pediatric cancers in general, some of the normal structures and some structures that may be more specific to contouring in pediatric cases that you might not think about in adults, and then reviewing contours specifically for Ewing's rhabdomyosarcoma and then non-rhabdomyosarcoma soft tissue sarcomas. So just by way of background, as you all know, pediatric patients are treated with uh, very intensive and multimodality therapy, and that's resulted in improvements in survival over time, but as they've lived longer, the late effects of these treatments have become more apparent. And this is just one of many studies specifically looking at Hodgkin's lymphoma patients where you can see the stabilization of um, mortality due to disease at about 10 to 15 years after treatment, but an increase in the rates of toxicity from the effects of treatment, such as cardiac disease and secondary malignancies. And certainly, both of those late effects could be due to radiation. Because of that, there's actually been a decline in the use of radiation in pediatric treatment protocols. This is just one study specifically looking at the use of radiation in pediatric protocols across a variety of disease sites. And you can see a general downward trend to avoid radiation and avoid these side effects of treatment. Of note, this study and all of the contouring I will be talking about is really specifically to COG um, North American protocols. So I would um, highly encourage everyone to work closely with your medical oncology team and make sure that you're following the contouring guidelines and appropriate treatment guidelines uh, based on the protocol that your patient is specifically being treated on. But as we think about other ways to improve um, the outcomes and minimize the toxicity, certainly improvements in radiation planning have occurred, moving from early 2D and 3D plans to much more complicated intensity modulated planning to minimize some of these late effects regardless of the protocol the patient is being treated on. And so today we will think in more detail how these contours are developed for soft tissue sarcomas. So in terms of the normal structures, in some ways these are just as important as the targets themselves, especially in pediatric cases. So because soft tissue sarcomas can arise from any part of the body, you need to think comprehensively about what areas could be affected by the radiation fields and what structures might receive dose that you would like to contour out as organs at risk. So just kind of working through the different body sites. Um, for the head and neck, we uh, routinely contour the globes, lenses, and lacrimal glands, the salivary glands, including the parotid glands and submandibular glands, pharyngeal constrictor muscles, thyroid, and then oral cavity and larynx. And these are just representative axial slices of a um, CT of the head and neck showing these contours of the importance organs at risk. I did include um, one link at the end to an available website that's completely free called Head, Neck, Brain, Spine that I think is really helpful in terms of delineating all of these normal structures. This is the axial um, CT showing the organs at risk that we routinely contour within the head and neck 
And a reminder that at the end of the slide, I do have a reference for a nice open atlas that you can access online to look at all of these structures. Within the thorax, we routinely contour the heart, lungs, esophagus, and spinal cord. And this is an axial scan demonstrating those organs at risk. The lungs are best seen when projected on the lung windows. If there's fluid or collapse of the lungs, we typically exclude that from the lung volume. Oftentimes, the heart substructures are mentioned in contouring atlases, including the LAD, the left ventricle, the aorta, and the superior vena cava. These are often extrapolated from adult volumes, and in current clinical practice, we don't really routinely contour all of these substructures. I do recommend contouring the esophagus on the mediastinal window, beginning at the level of the cricoid to the gastroesophageal junction. And then the spinal cord can be difficult to visualize on a CT scan, but often we'll use just the bony limits of the spinal canal as a slightly larger volume to make sure that we encompass that whole area. Most protocols don't necessarily specify the extent of the spinal cord contouring, but adult protocols recommend 10 centimeters above and below the PTV, which is a reasonable area. One other structure that I include here is the vertebral bodies, and we will look at this in a little more detail when we think about specific contours, but it is important to consider the vertebral bodies, especially in young patients who will continue to grow, and make sure that the vertebral body growth plates are covered uniformly to prevent scoliosis. Within the abdomen, we contour the liver, kidneys, bowel, occasionally the pancreas, and again, the vertebral bodies. And this is axial and coronal slices of those organs at risk. Most organs at risk within the abdomen and pelvis can be routinely visualized without contrast, although oral contrast can be helpful in contouring bowel, especially if you know you're going to a higher dose and you need to accurately um, draw all of those loops of bowel. Within the pelvis, we contour out the femoral heads, bowel, rectum, bladder, and in addition, we routinely contour out in females the ovary and uterus, and in males the testes. These are certainly more critical organs at risk in our pediatric patients, and often patients and parents want additional counseling in terms of the dose that will be delivered and the possible impact on fertility. So to the extent that we can see these on a CT scan, we do include them in our OAR contours. Um, in addition, especially in pediatric patients, the musculoskeletal system is its own organ at risk. We will draw out contralateral or unaffected bones that are near the target to try to limit the dose that goes to these structures. We will contour out growth plates and joint spaces around the target if they are not immediately within the target volume itself to try to avoid these as much as we can. There are growth plates both in the extremities, the vertebral bodies, and the pelvis, and these are some representative pictures of those. And so when thinking about simulation and setup, this similarly is very dependent on the site of the body that you're going to treat and certainly on your own institutional protocols. However, in general, these are some guidelines that we follow in terms of treatment for the different disease sites. So when thinking about treating a sarcoma that's within the head and neck, something that's orbital or perimeningeal, we are simulating these patients supine with a thermoplastic mask for immobilization. Within the thorax, patients are often positioned in a vac block bag or alpha cradle with a wing board. Similarly, for pediatric patients, um, when we treat within the abdomen and pelvis, smaller patients can also be immobilized in a vac lock bag or alpha cradle. And within the extremity, these actually can be somewhat complicated setups because the goal is to immobilize the extremity, which can rotate quite a lot from day-to-day -day setup, and then also to position the extremity so that you're not at risk of having beams enter or exit through the contralateral extremities. So oftentimes we will immobilize the two extremities in different planes and also use thermoplastic masks to immobilize the extremities so there's not as much rotation. And so in our institution, we routinely simulate using CT scans. One thing that we will do if the patient is large enough and we know we'll be able to get a signal is use a 4D CT scan for motion management. 
if that's not something that is available at your institution, when you know a tumor might be moving with inspiration and expiration, it is a good idea to consider using a larger margin in order to account for that. Within all of these sarcoma sites, it is important to fuse in any preoperative or pre-chemotherapy imaging and post-operative or post-chemotherapy imaging if that is available to you. And our daily imaging for treatment setup, here we rely very much on cone beam CTs and KV imaging, but certainly that will be dependent on the technology that's available at your institution. And you may need to think about modifying um, your margins for setup uncertainty based on the imaging that's available. And so these are some representative pictures of different site simulations for sarcomas that we've treated here in our department. This was a pediatric patient with an abdominal sarcoma. You can see positioned within a vac walk bag, a knee cushion for support, and then arms were raised above the head on a wing board. These are two examples of lower extremity sarcoma setups. And you can see, as I discussed before, our goal is to move the contralateral extremity out of the plane of the treatment field to minimize dose and beams going to that contralateral extremity. And then we often position the extremity on a mold cushion with a thermoplastic mask because there can be quite a bit of rotation day to day without that extra um, stabilization for setup. And these are examples of patients that we treated for sarcomas of the head and neck. On the left is an older young adult patient with a thermoplastic mask in place, knee cushion for support, holding an O-ring. And then on the right is just an example of a much younger patient who required daily anesthesia for treatment. Again, you can see the mold cushion for support and aquaplast mask. At, at this institution, we do use oral airways for some patients, and so that was placed for this patient, and the mask was cut out and molded around to accommodate that airway. So now um, diving a little bit more specifically into the actual contours themselves, we'll start with viewing sarcoma. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, all of these guidelines are really based on the most recent COG protocols, and so certainly important to communicate with your teams and, and determine which protocol the patient's being treated on to make sure that your contours and doses match with the treatment paradigm. But on the most, one of the most recent COG studies for Ewing 0031, they recommend two volumes, and this is something that is common across the sarcomas that we'll discuss today. They recommend treatment to an initial volume, which we'll call the gross tumor volume one, and that encompasses the gross tumor at its full extent prior to any surgery or chemotherapy. It would also include any pathologically involved lymph nodes. When you contour out this gross tumor volume one on your uh, patient's planning CT scan, there are a number of clinical considerations that you'll have to take into account because there will be changes in anatomy if the patient has received chemotherapy or surgery. So, if the tumor has a pushing margin into a body cavity such as the thorax, abdomen, or pelvis, you'll modify your volumes to take into account the return to the normal anatomy. So we would not want to ex include um, a gross tumor volume that extended into the lung but subsequently regressed after chemotherapy. However, if it was felt that there was invasion into an adjacent organ, then you would want to keep that as part of your gross tumor volume. And so an example of this might be if you had a tumor um, in the abdomen that was truly invading into adjacent bone or invading into an abdominal visceral organ, you would not want to remove the tumor volume from that area. You would want to include that. And for any unresected tumor that may have shrunk in response to chemotherapy, you really want to make sure that your GTV1 includes all of those initial areas of bone um, involvement and of soft, soft tissue involvement. From that contour of your gross, initial gross tumor volume, we expand one centimeter to create a clinical target volume that encompasses the area at risk of microscopic spread. And again, there are considerations that you'll have to account for when you ex make this expansion on your planning CT scan. Of course, this 
volume should not extend outside the patient. And you'll also want to modify this volume to account for specific barriers to anatomic spread, like bone, fascia, or skin. When you contour this, you will want to include any regional lymph node chains. However, only if those nodes were clinically or pathologically involved. For tumors without regional nodal involvement, we do not electively treat lymph nodes at this time. And then in addition to this, we will add a small margin for setup uncertainty based on your institutional imaging protocols and the site that the tumor is located. So this is an example of those initial volumes in a patient with a large unresectable iliac um, wing Ewing sarcoma. This tumor had involvement of the pelvic muscles and extension into sacral nerve foramina. And so you can see here that the gross tumor was contoured out as the red volume encompassing all of the area of initial soft tissue and bone involvement approaching the sacral nerve roots where the tumor was initially present in those areas. A one centimeter margin was expanded upon that to create the clinical target volume. And you can see in these slices that clinical target volume was cut off so that that did not extend into organs such as the rectum that the tumor was not initially invading. And then a small margin was added to account for setup uncertainty. After you've drawn out the initial volume, a second volume that's treated to a higher dose is contoured. This volume represents the most at-risk area for tumor recurrence that you want to treat to the higher dose. And for Ewing's, this is defined as all initial areas of bone involvement and any post-chemotherapy residual soft tissue tumor. So again, because these are primary tumors of the bone, this high dose area does include all of the initial areas of bone involvement. In order to create a clinical target volume, this is expanded by one centimeter. And again, you'll want to use those same clinical considerations to modify this so that it's certainly not extending outside of the patient or extending into any adjacent organs that the tumor was not initially involving or invading. And similarly, you'll use a planning target volume that's dependent on your own institutional protocols. And so this is the same right iliac case that I showed earlier, but instead of contouring the entire initial tumor volume, these contours represent the second phase of treatment, which includes only the areas of initial bony involvement and the post-chemotherapy residual soft tissue involvement. And so you can see that this GTB2 is significantly smaller um, than the initial tumor volume. And again, a small margin is added in order to account for possible microscopic extension. But again, that volume is not allowed to extend into the pelvic cavity or into the bowel or rectum. And then just by way of comparing these two volumes to really get a sense of the differences again, here on the left, you can see the initial phase of treatment where the entire initial tumor extent was contoured and contrast that with the boost volume on the right where we're only contouring the initial disease that was present in bone and the post-chemotherapy residual soft tissue volume. And so I do have another example of this in an extremity sarcoma that I will try to show here in prono. Can you see the contours on my other screen? We do not see prono. It's still the PowerPoint up on your screen, Dr. Bobo. Okay, thanks. Let me try again. Great. Okay. So this was a pediatric patient with um, an extremity Ewing sarcoma who elected to move forward with radiation as definitive therapy in order to avoid an amputation. And so in this case, we contoured out the initial tumor extent, which included both the initial soft tissue and bone component. The bony component was here in the left distal tip tibia, and there was only a very small amount of soft tissue components surrounding this initially. So not a lot of soft tissue extension on this tumor. And because of that, there was not a, a large amount of difference between the initial volume and the boost volume, because the boost volume continues to include all of the initial bony disease and the residual soft tissue involvement. So you can see 
that the difference between our initial GTV and our post-chemotherapy GTV was not that large for this particular case. From those volumes, we expanded with a one centimeter expansion on, to create the clinical target volume. For this case, we followed those recommendations to not include any areas that were not initially invaded by tumor where there was a barrier to spread. So we did not include the adjacent bones and we did not electively target the subcutaneous tissue and the skin in this volume. So again, we cropped quite a bit to create this clinical target volume. And then for this patient, this was actually one of the cases that I showed their setup for treatment. We had her immobilized with a cushion and an aquaplast mask over the extremity. So we felt comfortable using a very small three millimeter PTV margin for this case. We did crop the PTV margin out of skin so that it did not result in electively covering the skin to full dose or extending outside of the patient's body. And so the blue was the PTV for the initial volume and the purple was the PTV for the boost. And again, you can see that for this specific patient, those volumes were very, very similar. So within Ewing's and also rhabdomyosarcomas, there can be some special target volumes to consider where you may be covering larger entire organs or organ cavities. And two of those are the chest wall and the abdomen. So if a patient um, presents with pleural nodules, pleural fluid, and a chest wall primary tumor, you may need to include the entire hemithorax or even bilateral lungs as part of your initial treatment volume, followed by boosts to the primary site. So for these cases, we define a third clinical target volume that represents the lungs or pleural cavity. When you draw these out as part of your contours, you do need to ensure that this initial volume encompasses all of the subsequent volumes of boost so that your doses add up together and make sense for your planning. This is one area where I would consider using IMRT only if you had uh, 4D capabilities available in order to be able to account for the motion of respiration. If you don't have that ability, you might consider using 3D to make sure that you're covering the entire lung volume or using a very generous PTV margin of at least a centimeter to make sure you're not missing any part of your target because of motion. And so, this is one example of a patient that I treated with a chest wall Ewing's. On the right side, you can see the areas of disease that we contoured out to boost to the highest dose. And on the left side, the bilateral lungs that were treated as the initial part of this patient's treatment. There is a reference at the end of the slide regarding contouring for whole lung radiation using intensity modulated radiation if you have 4D scans available. And I will just leave that as a reference for those of you um, that have that interest or availability. Another area that can be targeted using intensity modulated radiation is the abdomen. So there are specific indications within pediatric protocols for treatment of the entire abd abdominal and pelvic cavity, specifically for patients with diffuse peritoneal disease or malignant ascites. And again, when using IMRT to contour this we create a third clinical target volume that is the entire abdomen and pelvic cavity. And you do want to make sure that that volume encompasses the full initial volume of disease so that you are sequentially treating and including your initial disease within the abdominal cavity target. When we draw these um, out, we do exclude the uninvolved kidneys and uninvolved liver to make sure that we don't deliver an unnecessarily high dose of radiation to those organs. And we use a large PTV margin of one centimeter on this abdominal cavity target because of respirations and because of the difficulty in exactly reproducing the setup for such a large target. And so this is an example of what that whole abdominal cavity would look like and dose distribution for this. 
you can see that with intensity modulated radiation, you are able to carve out of the liver, carve out of the kidneys, and spare the vertebral bodies. So this can be very beneficial use of IMRT for patients that do need whole abdomin abdominal radiation. And also at the end of the talk, I've provided two references to give uh, more detail for contouring and to have at your hand to reference. And I've also given those to the group who can hopefully distribute those to you. So next we'll move on to rhabdomyosarcoma. The contouring guidelines that I am going to present are also based on the most recent COG studies for rhabdomyosarcoma, ARST 0031, 0531, and 0431. I've provided those protocols as well, so you can go back and review these in more detail. So as with Ewing sarcoma, often in rhabdomyosarcoma, we are drawing two separate treatment volumes. An initial volume, which represents the pre-chemotherapy or pre-surgical gross tumor volume. And again, this is identified by clinical exams, diagnostic imaging, and encompasses the full extent of the tumor prior to any chemotherapy or surgery. Dr. Vogel, we have a quick question. If you sure. don't mind. Um, someone's asked, for treatment of whole abdomen radiation, what do you contour as organs at risk? So for that, we would contour out the liver um, and the kidneys. Those are the two primary organs at risk. And we also contour out in, in all patients the vertebral bodies. For young patients, we make sure that the vertebral bodies are treated uniformly if we think that they're still going to be growing. For older patients, we actually try to avoid the vertebral bodies to spare bone marrow. We also draw out the femoral heads and the genital organs. And I will say that the references at the end of the slide do also describe that well, and they also give dose constraint recommendations. For kidneys, we generally try to limit the mean dose to 18 gray, and for liver, less than 20 to 24 at the most. So those are probably the most critical for whole abdomen treatments. So for rhabdomyosarcoma, again, we are contouring out the initial tumor volume prior to any treatment. In terms of nodal treatments, very similar to Ewing's, we're only contouring out pathologically or clinically involved nodal disease. There's no elective nodal treatment as of yet for rhabdomyosarcoma. And similarly to Ewing's, if these tumors extended into cavities or viscera with pushing margins but not invading, we do exclude the normal anatomy that may have fallen back into our contour. And examples of this might be lung, intestine, or bladder, which was compressed by the tumor but not invaded and has subsequently re-expanded. For the clinical target volume, most often we use a margin of one centimeter. Occasionally we will use a smaller margin for the clinical target volume, especially if we're in uh, critical structures such as the head and neck where we're trying to um, avoid organs at risk. Similarly to Ewing's, our treatment volumes are limited by normal barriers to anatomic spread. So bone, muscle, fascia, all of these visceral or abdominal organs, the tumor was not initially invading. We will not include those in our clinical target volume. In terms of lymph node coverage, again, we're only covering out areas of pathologically involved lymph nodes. And for the clinical target volume, we will cover the regional nodal chain that those lymph nodes were present in. And our clinical target volume will have a planning treatment volume based on the location of the tumor and also your own institutional imaging protocols. Similarly to Ewing sarcoma, we also define a post-chemotherapy or post-surgery gross tumor volume. And this is the extent of visible residual tumor identified after chemotherapy or surgery. This could be on exam or your diagnostic imaging. Considerations for this are that if there has been no change in terms of the treatment volume after chemotherapy, then the volume will be exactly the same. We won't create a boost volume. If there has been a complete uh, response to chemotherapy or a complete resection with no visible primary tumor, then we will not be drawing a boost volume. We will only be treating our initial gross tumor volume. Similarly to the initial volume, we use a clinical target volume of 
expansion of around one centimeter, unless we're in very critical structures where we're worried about extending the volume and increasing the size of the target. Similarly, we're also accounting for barriers to anatomic spread and for normal tissue re-expansion based on our planning CT scans. Again, if there has been a gross resection or complete response to chemotherapy, we're not drawing out this boost volume. We're only using the initial target. And so this is the general framework for rhabdomyosarcoma, but the most challenging part of treating rhabdomyosarcomas is really that they can arise within anywhere in the body. So I'll spend a little bit of time going through some of the site-specific considerations with some pictures to hopefully illustrate some of these principles. And then I do have one case I'll pull up in prono. For parameningeal or head and neck rhabdomyosarcomas, these tumors can have a high tendency to spread intracranially. And if the tumor is anywhere near the skull base, it can be very, very useful to review all of these diagnostic images with a radiologist to confirm that your clinical margins are encompassing all of the areas of initial disease and areas at risk. Within the head and neck, as with any rhabdomyosarcoma, but just to reiterate, unlike adult sarcomas, we do not cover elective lymph nodes. If a patient does not have initial lymph node involvement, we do not electively treat lymph nodes. However, if patients do have clinically or pathologically involved nodes, we do cover the involved nodes to the highest dose and the ipsilateral draining nodal basin as part of our target. And one thing to be aware of, especially with IMRT, is that as these patients receive their chemotherapy and radiation, there can be a very rapid response. And if there's a large change in the size of the tumor, it can be helpful to replan during treatment. And that can certainly minimize the dose to local organs at risk. And so this is an example of a paramenangeal rhabdomyosarcoma. You can see the pre-chemotherapy and post-chemotherapy MRIs for this patient in the two images on the left, and then the corresponding planning CT on the right. The, gross, the initial gross tumor volume is contoured in red, and the boost volume, which was contoured as the post-chemotherapy volume, is contoured um, in purple. And then the corresponding CTVs are contoured in green and in blue on the MRIs. And so you can see that the post-chemotherapy volume is somewhat smaller than the pre-chemotherapy volume. You can also see in this that the clinical target volume was appropriately cropped so that it did not extend into the uninvolved orbital structures. And then you can see all of those volumes overlaid on each other on the planning CT scans again with the initial gross tumor volume in red and the boost gross tumor volume in this solid purple here, the clinical target volume expansions for both of those in uh, green and blue. When considering volumes for orbital rhabdomyosarcoma, there are also some important considerations um, for this disease site specifically. We define the orbit as the bony cavity containing the globe, the nerves, the vessels, and the extraocular muscles. For orbital rhabdomyosarcoma, the entire orbit is not irradiated for localized orbital tumors. And the clinical target volume should really not even include the globe, since this is not the area that the tumor was arising from, unless there is frank invasion of this structure from the tumor. Again, the clinical target volume should only extend into the bony orbit if there was evidence of bone involvement at the beginning. Um, and really the important target for orbital rhabdo is the muscle itself, and a site of failure that can occur is within the posterior orbit, so you should make sure to follow the muscle back to its point of insertion and include that in your clinical target volume. And so this is an example of an orbital rhabdomyosarcoma with the MRI on top and the planning CT scan on bottom. This patient um, did not have a significant response by imaging to chemotherapy, so we only contoured out one volume. In red, you can see the gross tumor volume, and then in blue, the clinical target volume. 
And so again, important things to note for these volumes. If you look at panel three, our clinical target volume is not extending into the orbit because there was not orbital invasion by this tumor. Our clinical target volume is covering the extraocular muscle um, back to the point of insertion, and it's cropped at uh, bone because this tumor was not invading bone, and that would represent an anatomic barrier to spread. When thinking about treating extremity rhabdomyosarcomas, again, as part of uh, the treatment for all of these rhabdomyosarcomas, we are not prophylactically covering lymph nodes unless there were pathologically or clinically involved lymph nodes. Extremity sarcomas can be very challenging to contour because the positioning on the planning CT is often quite different than the diagnostic imaging. And so if you are uncertain because of differences in the setup, you can consider being more generous with your margins to cover those areas of uncertainty. If your fusions are very different in terms of positioning, it can also be helpful to set up your planning CT side by side with the diagnostic image and make sure that the areas that you're covering make sense with the areas of the initial tumor and be sure to look in the axial, coronal, and sagittal images um, to correlate all of those locations. When we contour the extremity rhabdomyosarcomas, we want to make sure that we're covering all areas that could represent tumor spread, including any T2 change on an MRI, if that's available to you, which would indicate edema and possible areas of tumor infiltration. Specifically for extremity sarcomas, we try to limit circumferential irradiation of the extremity um, in order to prevent lymphedema in the future. However, if that's not possible, it is something that we consider reasonable if it's a small um, area that we are irradiating in its entirety, and especially if it's not extending across a joint. We try to limit um, the extension of volumes across joints as these would represent barriers to anatomic spread, and we will modify our CTVs to try to spare both strips of skin and joints when we are, feel comfortable that there's not a strong evidence of tumor spread into these areas. And so this is an example of a rhabdomyosarcoma of the thigh in a pediatric patient, and in the red is the initial gross tumor volume. The tumor did not extend or frankly involved the subcutaneous tissues or skin, and it did not involve bone. So the clinical target volume is contoured in green, and you can see again that it is limited to not extend into skin or subcutaneous tissue. It's cropped at the bone, and it's modified at the fascial planes to not extend into uninvolved muscle groups. Another area that can present a lot of challenges in terms of contouring and targeting are tumors that arise in the pelvis and specifically bladder and prostate, which are often treated with definitive radiation therapy. This is one area where changing anatomic positions because of shift in the size of the tumor and variations in bladder and bowel filling can make it very challenging to reproducibly set up these patients and draw the volumes. So PTV margins may need to be a little bit more generous to account for changes in positioning of these pelvic organs. In older children, it can be helpful to simulate them with a comfortably full bladder to try to improve bladder reproducibility. In young children, if they are receiving IV fluids with sedation, the bladder volume can increase or decrease uh, based on the day. So at the time of simulation, it can actually be helpful to scan them more than once to get a sense of how much your bladder volume might change. If you've noticed a large change in terms of bladder volume, we have used catheters that we clamp in a very small subset of patients just to try to reproducibly make sure our, our bladder volume is the same. There are patients that may present with bladder outlet obstruction that can result in renal impairment or re renal failure, and there are occasionally patients that because of that need to have nephrostomy tubes placed pr prior to initiation of radiation treatments. And so this is an example of a stage three, group three rhabdomyosarcoma of the prostate. You can see the pre-chemotherapy CT on the right and the volumes that were drawn out for this case. We have the gross tumor volume prior to chemotherapy in red, the post-chemotherapy gross tumor volume in green, and you can see the clinical target volume that was created 
based on the initial tumor in the scan on the left. And you can see that the clinical target volume was modified very extensively to not include the uninvolved rectum, to not extend into uninvolved bone, and to only contour the areas of the bladder that were initially involved by tumor. And so for these tumors specifically, reviewing the diagnostic imaging at the beginning, discussing the case with your urology um, colleagues in order to determine what parts of the anatomy were actually involved by tumor is very critical. And so I do have one example of a perimeningeal rhabdomyosarcoma that I can show in prono. This was actually the young adult patient whose simulation setup I showed earlier. And so in this patient, we actually initiated his radiation treatments concurrently with chemotherapy. So we only drew out one gross tumor volume. This is his primary tumor, which was actually, frankly, invading the brain, which was pushing against, but not invading the orbit, and which was certainly invading into the bone and extending down into the soft tissues to the top of the mandible. This patient also had gross lymph nodes involved at the time of presentation, and so we contoured those out separately as a um, gross lymph node target. And then we created our clinical target volumes. So for the lymph nodes, we contoured out the lymph node regions where these gross nodes were present to treat to a slightly lower dose. For the gross tumor, we created an expansion. Given the proximity of this tumor to so many critical structures, we did use only a five millimeter expansion for this particular case. We did allow our expansion to go into brain because this tumor did involve the brain at the beginning. We did allow the volume to go into the bone because this tumor was eroding and invading into the bone, but we did crop this volume to not extend into the uninvolved globe, either on the right side um, or the left side. And then because this patient was immobilized in a mask, we used um, small three millimeter PTV volumes for both of those targets. We did allow the PTV to expand. We did not crop the PTV volume. And so you can see that some of the high dose region was going towards this patient's globe. He fortunately had a very good response to chemotherapy and radiation. And so we were able to replan to be able to minimize the amount of our treatment volume that extended into the globe based on his response to treatment. So for the last section of the talk, we'll review the non-rhabdomyosarcoma soft tissue sarcomas. The volumes that I will be describing for these particular tumor types are based on ARST0332 and 1321. And for both of these protocols, we consider two different possibilities in terms of when radiation might be given for these patients, either preoperatively or postoperatively. And there are two sets of volumes that are described in order to account um, for both of those clinical scenarios. In terms of the preoperative radiation, again, very similar to both Ewing's and rhabdomyosarcoma, we will be drawing out a gross tumor volume. And we want to identify this on diagnostic imaging. And then similarly, again, we are only contouring out pathologically involved lymph nodes as part of our gross tumor target. When we think about the clinical target volume for these patients, there are actually two different sets of recommendations based on the patient's skeletal maturity. So for skeletally immature patients, meaning those patients that are prepubertal, that are still going to be growing, generally those patients less than around 16 years of age, we use a smaller margin to try to minimize the impact of the radiation and the possible late toxicities. So for this younger group of patients, our clinical target volume is an expansion uniformly of one and a half centimeters.
Again, we use the same types of clinical considerations to not allow this margin to expand into uninvolved subcutaneous tissue, into uninvolved bone, or into uninvolved muscle groups. For older patients who have completed their growth and where we are more comfortable with a larger treatment field, the pediatric protocols in North America have actually adopted the margins recommended by the adult RTOG 0630 protocol. And I've provided this again, both to the RIOS group to share with you and at the references at the end. In this protocol, the width of the margin or the length of the margin varied depending on the size and the grade of the tumor. So for large tumors that were high grade, they recommended a longitudinal margin of three centimeters superiorly and inferiorly and a one and a half centimeter radial margin. For smaller tumors, they recommended a slightly smaller longitudinal margin of just two centimeters superiorly and inferiorly and again a one and a half centimeter radial margin. When thinking about these clinical target margins, both for skeletally immature and mature patients, there are a number of things to consider when you're drawing out those expansions. Similarly to um, extremity rhabdomyosarcoma, we want to make sure that we include any suspicious uh, peritumoral edema that would be seen on our T2-weighted MRI that might represent an areas of tumor infiltration, even if this is beyond that specified one and a half to three centimeter expansion. This can sometimes cause the fields to be very, very large and in some cases cause extension beyond the anatomic compartment. If chasing all of that T2 signal results in extension beyond the anatomic compartment, you can consider sh shrinking your field somewhat to the end of the compartment with a small margin of a centimeter if that is reasonable based on the patient's imaging. In terms of the radial margin, this should include any part of the tumor, but again, should be limited by any intact fascial planes, bone, or the skin surface. In terms of skin surfaces, we're not um, targeting these as clinical target volumes unless they are actively involved by gross disease. Oftentimes we are seeing these patients after they've had some type of biopsy or small um, incision as part of their workup and diagnosis. That does not necessarily need to be targeted to the full dose of radiation if you communicate with your surgeon and know that that will be resected to time of their definitive surgery. And finally, again, similar to discussions with rhabdo, if there are pathologic involved nodes and it does not extend your field significantly, you can consider treating the entire involved nodal chain as your clinical target volume. So here we can see the preoperative coronal MRI and PET CT images. This was an adolescent female with a synovial sarcoma of the right upper thigh. The plan for her treatment was neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy and then followed by a surgical resection after radiation. You can see uh, the MRI, the arrow here in red, showing enhancement tracking up the femoral and external iliac vessels, and then FDG avidity on the PET confirming that there was tumor involvement and tumor thrombus of those vessels. So all of those diagnostic images were used in order to contour the patients on the patient's clinical CT scan for radiation planning on the left. In terms of organs at risk, we contoured out the rectum, bladder, femoral heads, and genital organs. And then we also contoured out a knee joint as part of the radiation plan. We did use IV contrast given that we were trying to delineate the vessels with our planning CT scan. And so on the panel A, you can see the fusion of our planning CT scan with the PET scan. It is very faint, but there is a green target that represents the gross tumor volume, and then a yellow expansion, which is our one and a half centimeter radial expansion on that to create the clinical target volume. And you can see that the expansion was limited to exclude all of those areas of anatomic spread, such as the small bowel, the bone, and the perineum.
we also felt that the fascial plane between the superficial and deep muscle compartment represented a barrier to spread and limited our clinical ex target expansion at those interfaces. And we also excluded uninvolved subcutaneous tissue and cropped that out of the expansion. You can see in this panel where the MRI showed edema and T2 signal, and so all of that was also contoured as part of this patient's clinical target volume. And so this is the axial and coronal images demonstrating what the final volume looked like with the GTV in green, the clinical target volume in yellow, and the planning treatment volume expansion on that. Post-operative radiation therapy can be recommended in certain cases, especially patients where there is microscopic positive margin or gross tumor after the time of resection. These can be very challenging cases to contour because of the significant changes in anatomy. And so that is really the large area to focus on when comparing your planning CT scan to any available diagnostic imaging. When we contour these, again, we create a gross tumor volume, which is reconstructed on our planning scan, comparing and fusing with the original tumor volume seen on the preoperative imaging. The clinical target volume expansions are exactly the same in terms of the length as with preoperative radiation, so using that one and a half centimeter uniform expansion for young patients who will still be growing, and one and a half to three centimeter expansions for older patients. But again, we have to adapt that gross tumor volume to the postoperative anatomy, modifying to exclude any areas that may have extended into cavities or compressed organs that subsequently return to their normal position. When we draw out our clinical target volumes expansions in the postoperative setting, we also need to consider that we should be treating all of the um, area at risk for microscopic disease. So this would include the operative bed, any seroma, any clips, the surgical incision, and it can be very helpful to review operative notes or discuss the surgery with your surgeon to make sure that entire um, tumor bed is included in your target. And again, you'll follow similar guidelines to exclude any normal tissues that would have been barriers to tumor spread and keep those out of your target volume. With postoperative radiation, we do create a sequential gross tumor volume for areas of close or positive microscopic margins or certainly any areas of gross residual disease. If you are specifically giving a boost to an area of a close or positive margin, this is something, again, that needs to be reviewed in the operative note with a pathology report and discussed with, with the surgeon when that's possible. We use a slightly smaller expansion to create our, cl our clinical target volume for the boost of just one centimeter because this will be the highest dose area and should really only represent the most at-risk region. So this is an example of a patient with a high-grade retroperitoneal sarcoma. The patient was underwent a resection, but only had one centimeter of, or one millimeter surgical margins. And so post-operative radiation was recommended for this patient, and it was delivered as two volumes, 45 gray to an initial tumor volume, and a boost um, to the area of close surgical margins. And so you can see why these cases are um, so challenging. On the right, we have the patient's diagnostic imaging, and then on the left, the patient's planning CT scan. And so in order to contour this patient, the gross tumor volume at the time of diagnosis was contoured, and you can see that contour in purple. And then a clinical target volume was created, modifying for changes in anatomy and return of normal structures, and accounting for that one and a half centimeter margin that we wanted to include. And so the target really was the paraspinal musculature, and so that was included. And the residual lymph node regions encompassed in the one and a half centimeter expansion. We discussed the area that was most at risk for microscopic margins with the surgeon and contoured the boost clinical target volume, which is seen in green. And again, this was edited to exclude small bowel, liver, kidney, bone. And we also made sure that that entire boost volume was encompassed in the original target volume. <laughs> 
And so these are the PTVs that were generated based on those two treatment volumes for the patient. Again, covering the involved musculature, covering all of the areas of CLPS, with the larger field being the initial volume and the smaller field being the most at-risk area. And I do have an example of a preoperative rhabdomyosarcoma case. So this was a uh, young patient with a synovial sarcoma of the left thigh. And we were treating her preoperatively. So we fused our planning CT scan with the MRI, which I unfortunately um, don't have to show you, but you can see fairly clearly the gross tumor that we were targeting in this preoperative setting. It was a very large tumor in this young patient. Here, extending down, these were areas of continued T2 signal abnormality and post-contrast abnormality that is not as easily seen on the CT scan but was very clear on her MRI. We created a one and a half centimeter radial expansion However, we cropped this expansion out of bone and out of subcutaneous tissue that was not involved. Inferiorly, our volume went quite a bit longer than one and a half centimeter because, and wrapped around farther than one and a half centimeter because we saw a significant amount of T2 change in this area. And we were still far enough away from the joint and within the anatomic compartment and felt it was safe and reasonable to consider or to continue treating this whole area. So we did follow the T2 change all the way down in this specific case. And because of the larger field and the possibility of rotation and, and setup, we used, I believe, a five millimeter PTV margin for this case. We did not crop the PTV out of bone or make any modifications after we created the PTV expansion. So before we pause for any questions, which I'm happy to answer, I do want to point you to some really helpful references and resources. Head, neck, brain, spine is the site that I mentioned that is open access and really does a good job with all of that normal anatomy. I highly recommend this book, Target Volume Delineation for Pediatric Cancers. I got many of my samples from this book. There is a lot of very valuable tips and pearls for contouring pediatric cases, and it doesn't just include soft tissue sarcomas. It goes through all of the central nervous system tumors, renal tumors, and it's just a really valuable resource for anyone who might be treating pediatric patients with IMRT and, and needs all of that good detail on target volumes. The whole abdomen series, one very good one is from MD Anderson. This describes their um, organs at risk, their dose constraints, and the volumes themselves. Similarly, for those of you that might have 4D capabilities and be able to consider using intensity modulated treatments for whole lung, the article by uh, Dr. Kalpurakal describes all of that in great detail. The RTOG adult protocol and those margins for non rhabdomyosarcoma soft tissue tumors is here with the 0630 publication. And then, apologize for that typo. This is a very helpful publication from the group at University of Florida that describes how they contour paramenangeal rhabdomyosarcomas and is also helpful for just some more detail for those specific types of tumors. And certainly these slides will be available and all of the papers I believe I sent over. So at this point, I'm um, happy to answer any questions that might be outstanding or, or review any of the slides. For clarification. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for your time and attention, and I hope this was helpful. Hi, Dr. Vogel. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Okay. If you don't mind, would you please go over the slide with the whole abdominal irradiation just to see the lower extent, where exactly you end the contouring? Yes. Thank you very much. Sure. I tend to extend my margin to the top of the pubic symphysis. 
We're trying to contour out the peritoneal cavity, the abdomen, and pelvic organs, but we're not specifically targeting the entire vaginal canal or anal canal. So this is a pretty good picture of that, just stopping around the top of the pubic synthesis. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. We have a question in the chat as well. The question reads, do you go to doses above 50.4 for rhabdomyosarcoma if there is gross disease? That is a very good question and, and one that's discussed quite a bit. I, it, I will say the answer varies a lot um, based on institutional practice and comfort. For my practice right now, I do not go beyond 50.4. We are still awaiting the results of studies looking at whether escalation to 59.4 is beneficial in tumors that were greater than five centimeters. And because there is quite a large difference in terms of toxicity risk with 50.4 versus 59.4, my practice has been to wait for those data um, prior to increasing the dose for gross disease. We have another question in the chat reading, if the patient has lung metastases and abdominal metastases, do you do a sequential field treatment? That I have discussed quite a bit with my medical oncology colleagues here. I tend to try to treat those whenever possible concurrently, but certainly it depends on the age and performance status of the patient. I have found in young patients it's possible to deliver those types of treatments at the same time if the patient is not receiving concurrent chemo. But if the patient needs to continue receiving chemo, it can certainly be very toxic. And so we do occasionally have to separate out the volumes. I think the benefit of treating them together is certainly to avoid overlap and you know excess dose to the liver and kidneys. But that is, it becomes very individualized based on the patient's ability to tolerate that and the plans for concurrent systemic therapy. Uh, follow-up question, how do you determine the match line? So there is a very good description of this in the CalProcol study. There are different ways to do it. I'm very fortunate here to have a tomotherapy machine, so we are able to treat these in one large field and we don't necessarily need to match. In the CalProcol study, they do describe creating a dose gradient so that you are overlapping the fields with a gradient match in the area of the abdomen. You can either do that the way they describe it is by creating a dose box where you account for the dose from the upper field and the lower field. And so I think that's a, a very helpful resource if you're um, running into those questions and looking to plan, knowing that you'll have that type of match line. I don't see any further questions in hands raised or within our chat. Great. Well, I hope this was helpful and certainly we'll make sure that the resources get to you. I'm also happy if the group wants to share my email if any other questions come up in the future. All right, thanks all. To seek uh, guidance from my fellow radiation oncologists in our department to ask them for their thoughts or to head to the radiology reading room and to have our radiology colleagues who are really experts in reading imaging look at my contours and make suggestions. So I think that's a really powerful tool, you know, it's just relying on your colleagues. It's always important to ask for help. Finally, you know, we're focusing on CT-based uh, planning. However, over the years in our department, I think many others in the States, we are using MRI of the prostate for treatment planning and some centers treatment delivery, just because it, it, it does provide a more better delineated anatomy of the prostate and is very helpful. But certainly, you know, we don't always have access to the MRI scan. And I think one of the biggest things that I, I would stress as we were kind of talking about contouring the prostate is that, you know, while we want it, the, our contouring to be as, as perfect as possible, and we really want to min, you know, minimize excess exposure to the rectum or the bladder, or the, the bony anatomy, the worst thing we could do would be to miss prostate and miss disease and, and have a patient recur down the road. So I think if there's ever a concern about whether something is, is prostate tissue or not, it's better to err on the side of safely overestimating your prostate rather than, than you know, being too tight or too stringent. So we just covered a lot of ground there with prostate contouring. And I think uh, now would be a really good opportunity to pause and, 
and ask some questions or, or take some questions that is. So let's see. The first question I see here from Dr. Khan is how inferior should we contour when the prostate apex cores are positive, especially in the inclusion of the GU diaphragm? So that's a really good question. And one thing that I, I neglected to mention is when I sit down to contour a prostate, the first thing that I do is I pull up the patient's chart and I review his clinical history, including his biopsy. And I look to see where disease was involved. And, you know, I, I typically am a little more generous in those areas. So if they have apical involvement of, of all, or all their cores are positive in the apex, then I'm not going to be real tight in the area of the apex of the prostate. I'm going to be more generous and very likely probably because of that include the GU diaphragm, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. So I absolutely look at the um, pathology report as well, as well as any sort of imaging that's been obtained that may help me. The next question was margins in the setting of extracapsular extension. You know, I think it's really difficult to assess extracapsular extension on CT. It's much better image on MRI. And as mentioned, I typically use an, a CT MRI a simulation. So I have that MRI scan. I don't add a standard margin for extracapsular extension. I just ensure that I generously cover that area and, you know, what the kind of margins that I use are really out of the scope of this lecture this morning. So what can we do with suboptimal bladder filling? Our patients with longstanding LUTs struggle. So that's a struggle that I face daily in clinic as well. So one thing I really um, try to understand patients' urinary symptoms when I meet them for the first time in consultation. And you really try to make modifications even before we get to CT stem. I think the first thing is kind of those better understanding, you know, do they have urinary urgency? Do they have urgency or stress incontinence? Is it that they have, you know, weak stream or hesitancy? And that will help to direct my management of their urinary symptoms in anticipation of simulation and treatment. I think I can't stress focusing on just behavioral modifications before jumping to medical management of lower urinary tract symptoms. Again, you know, I have gentlemen that come into my clinic and they're drinking three pots of coffee and having teas with caffeine and soda, and they're wondering why they have to urinate all day long. So minimizing caffeine and even decaffeinated coffee has a little bit of caffeine in minimizing any carbonated beverages like soda, carbonated water, seltzer water, juices, you know, orange juice, grapefruit juice, lemonade, tomato juices, those are all acidic and can really irritate the lining of the bladder and lead to urinary frequency. Alcohol is another factor. If patients have obstructive urinary symptoms, then, you know, I, I will consider putting them on an alpha adrenergic or an alpha agonist like tamsulosin to help them more completely empty their bladder when they do urinate so they don't constantly feel like they need to go. For patients that have urgency, I put them on antispasmodic agents like oxybutynin. I do that with caution because sometimes these patients have urgency, but they also have some obstructive urinary symptoms. And I have had a couple of patients that have gone into urinary retention after taking oxybutynin. You know, again, so I think the best strategy is to optimize urinary symptoms prior to simulation and to treatment and to really focus on finding kind of a comfortable bladder filling during the time of simulation, you know, and, and, and making sure the patient's aware that he's going to need to keep similar bladder filling for the duration of his course of radiation therapy. And if he doesn't think that he can do that, then you might need to have him urinate and fill again to a more comfortable level. All right. So the next question that we have here is with high-risk localized prostate cancer without seminal vesicle involvement, how much cranial, cranial caudal contour of seminal vesicles do I apply if there's a high score of, uh, of seminal vesicle involvement? Um, again, I can briefly touch upon this, but it's not really in, in, included in this lecture, but for all men with intermediate risk prostate cancer, I include the proximal one centimeter of the seminal vesicles. For men with high risk localized prostate cancer without seminal vesicle involvement, 
I will treat the entire prostate and entire seminal vesicle to a baseline dose, typically 50.4 centigrade. And then I will escalate the prostate and the proximal seminal vesicle to, to a higher dose. In, in my practice, typically that's 75, 60 centigrade. All right, so it's 11 o'clock and we, we still have a little bit of content to go and I wanna leave time for questions at the end. So maybe we'll forge ahead. I hope everybody's hanging in there. We're covering a, a lot of material today. All right, so the next topic for prostate contouring will be contouring the postoperative prostate bed for either adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy after prostatectomy. Again, we're lucky that we have R2G consensus guidelines for the definitions of the prostate bed because it's even it's difficult to contour the prostate when the prostate's there. It's even more difficult to contour when there's no prostate there. So fortunately, there are you know this consensus guideline constructed by you know at, or global leaders in prostate cancer management to provide guidance for us in the setting of uh, postoperative uh, prostate bed treatment. And these are the borders of the postoperative bed. And I think what's critical to understand is that we use the pubic symphysis to kind of um, delineate how we contour. And there's a way that we contour the prostate bed below the pubic symphysis, and then some modifications or changes that we make above the pubic symphysis. So this slide is for your reference. We're gonna go through each one of these borders, both below and above the pubic symphysis. So the inferior border references the vesicular urethral anastomosis, or VUA. And I think this is, again, one of those structures akin to the, the challenges of identifying the apex that can be really difficult to see, especially on CT scan. But the vesicular, vesicular urethral anastomosis, or VUA, is the surgical connection between the bladder neck and the membranous urethra after the prostate's removed. When the prostate's removed, the prostate urethra grows with it. And this is the reconnection that enables men to avoid through the urethra. Um, penis. I mean, it can be really hard to see on CT anatomy. One tip that I have for visualizing the VUA is to look at the sagittal uh, plane, and the you'll see kind of an, the iso intense dark urine kind of narrow at the bladder neck. And the last most inferior slice that you can see urine typically represents that anastomosis there, identified with the red arrow. So the inferior border of below the pubic, or the inferior border of the prostate bed is typically between eight and 12 millimeters below the vesicular urethral anastomosis. But as I said, this can be really difficult to see. So another surrogate for the inferior border of the prostate bed volume is one slice above the penile bulb. So you know, my suggestion is that if you're really having a difficult time imaging the, the VUA, another alternative is starting more inferiorly. And when, and when you see that last slice of penile bulb, that next slice superiorly is the inferior border of your prostate bed volume. Now, the anterior border is the pubic symphysis here. The posterior border of the prostate bed below the pubic symphysis um, is the anterior rectal wall. And then the lateral borders are either the levator ani muscles, which you can see outlined or see identified in the um, slice on the left. And as you move more superiorly or cranially, the levator ani will disappear. And then that lateral border becomes the obturator internus muscle. Now, as mentioned, we make some changes to our borders as we start to move superiorly or cranially above the pubic symphysis. The anterior border becomes the posterior one to two centimeters of the bladder wall. And the way that we do this is once we get above the pubic symphysis, we start to gradually move our anterior border posteriorly. So over a few slices, you move that anterior border posteriorly. And then you'll include that one to two centimeter of the posterior bladder wall. And typically it's in my practice, I use a, a one centimeter inclusion of the posterior bladder wall for my anterior border, just because you, know, you end up treating a lot of bladder that I think is kind of minimally at risk for harboring microscopic disease by using the, the two centimeter border. But that's just my personal practice. 
And then you can, this is the sagittal slice of a patient of mine where you can see that, you know, the, that gradual posterior regression of the anterior border of the prostate bed. And then we have this inclusion of the one, one to two centimeter of the posterior bladder wall. Now, the posterior border, as you get above the pubic symphysis, is actually the mesorectum. And if you look at the CT slice on the right, my, this is a patient that I contoured and I actually included um, some tissue beyond the mesorectum there. So my, my posterior border is actually probably a little generous, maybe even a little, one might consider a little too generous, but it's that mesorectal fascia that typically forms the posterior border. The lateral border, as you're above the pubic symphysis for the prostate bed, consists of the sacro-rectogenital pubic fascia, which is sometimes difficult to see. I think you can actually see it pretty clearly on this CT slice on the left, pointed to by the red arrow. And then as you move more inferiorly, you often you lose the distinct fascia and you can utilize the obturator internus as your lateral border for your prostate bed volume. Okay, now the superior border, as you move superiorly, the consensus guidelines describe you contoured the level of the cut ends of the vas deferens or three to four centimeters above the top of this pubic symphysis. So there's some variability here. And many, including many of the recent post-operative prostate bed trials, discuss inclusion of all seminal vesicle remnants. So if you can see seminal vesicle that's there, it's typically included within your prostate bed volume until you don't see seminal vesicles. And kind of the CT slice on the left here, you can see the right and left seminal vesicles, the left seminal vesicle remnants fairly prominent. And then this is the kind of most superior slice. You actually don't see seminal vesicle on the right here in this middle CT slice. It's actually, you see the vas deferens moving anteriorly, but on the left, you can see a tiny little remnant. So this was actually the last slice that I included for this patient that I contoured here. And sometimes in the sagittal view, you can actually see the seminal vesicle remnant, or you can alternatively see the vas deferens moving anteriorly. And that's where I really end my prostate bed volume. Uh, you know, and kind of as we talk talked about, you know, one of the questions for intact prostate contouring is, you know, what if you have ap apical involvement? I also look at the biopsy pathology and I look at the prostatectomy pathology and, you know, that may guide how superior I go or where my inferior border is or where I'm a little more generous laterally. So I think it's always important to consider each individual's clinical and pathologic features when you're contouring. And kind of the, the shape of the prostate bed is kind of a funky shape. Some people say that it, it looks like a genie bottle. Others say it looks like a toilet. So this is kind of the general shape that you want to get for your prostate bed. All right. So I mentioned earlier in my lecture this, mor this uh, morning that we revisit prostate nodal anatomy. So this is just, again, a slide for your reference, um, reviewing the nodal drainage pattern from the prostate extending superiorly. And like our other uh, sites, we are fortunate enough to have some guidelines to help us contour the pelvic lymph nodes in the setting of prostate cancer. In fact, hot off the press, my colleague Bill Hall recently updated our prostate nodal consensus guidelines. This was presented um, at Astro last month and is in press in the Red Journal. So I'd like to walk you through Dr. Hall's updated pelvic lymph node volumes. And again, this will be a reference that will be sent to you. So when we're contouring the pelvic lymph nodes, we want to include the lymph nodes that are at risk for harboring microscopic disease. One of the updates to these guidelines are the most superior aspect of contouring our pelvic lymph nodes. And whereas historically the superior border of the pelvic lymph nodes contour contours would be between L5 and S1, studies have demonstrated that there's a significant incidence of involvement of common iliac lymph nodes in prostate cancers. So the new guidelines advocate for beginning contours at the bifurcation of the aorta into the common iliacs, which typically is at the L4, L5 inner space. Okay. When contouring the lymph nodes, we really use the arteries and vessels as surrogates for where lymphatic channels and nodes are. So we use a five to seven um, millimeter 
uh, radius around the iliac arteries and vessels, excluding this contour from bone, bowel, bladder, muscle, kind of natural barriers to spread of disease. And there's a suggestion of being even a little more generous anteriorly. There can be kind of small vessels anteriorly and small lymph nodes anteriorly that, that historically have been missed by uh, limiting the contour radius to five to seven millimeters. So you know, there's some, guide, some instruction or, or consideration to be a little more generous anteriorly. Another region that's kind of an update in this atlas is to ensure that there's good coverage between the vertebral body and the psoas muscle here because there can be lymphatic tissue in this region. And that's more in line with our GI nodal contouring. So the space in between the external and internal iliac um, artery should, and, and veins should be up to about three centimeters. But, you know, that's going to be variable based on patient anatomy. And we want to continue to include the prevertebral, presacral, and posterior mesorectal nodes to the bottom of S3. Remember, one of the lymphatic drainage patterns is from the prostate or the subcapsular lymphatics of the prostate straight to the subaortic lymph nodes. So we, we do continue to include these presacral subaortic lymph nodes to, to about the level of S3, identified on the sagittal image here. Now, as we go more inferiorly, the posterior border of the CTV of the internal iliac um, vessels starts to kind of move to be at the level of the anterior piriformis muscle. And we want to ensure that we are covering adequately the pudendal um, artery and inferior gluteal artery. So this can be an area posteriorly that historically we had been kind of shy on or, or sometimes they missed coverage, but you want to make sure to include um, the areas around those arteries. And then as you move more inferiorly, getting close to the level of the seminal vesicles, you can begin to move that posterior border a little anteriorly kind of and make it to be about the level of the anterior border of the piriformis muscle. Now, we know that as we move inferiorly, the external iliacs will start to pass through the inguinal canal and become the inguinal lymph nodes. And so inguinal lymph nodes are not a common drainage pattern for prostate cancer, so we don't need to include those. So as we are, as the external iliacs are beginning to enter the inguinal canal, that's when we start to peel the anterior border of our nodal contours kind of more posteriorly. Another landmark is when the external iliacs are lateral to the most medial portion of the acetabulum, that's really when we can separate the external iliacs and inguinal lymph nodes from the remaining obturator lymph nodes that are here. And then we continue to contour the obturator nodes inferiorly using the obturator internus as a kind of uh, guide. We want to make sure that that anterior border of the obturator lymph nodes is about a centimeter anterior to the obturator muscle. And the posterior border is kind of right at the edge of the um, obturator muscle. And then we slowly begin to taper the obturator lymph nodes at the top of the seminal vesicles here until we reach the area where either the seminal vesicles join the prostate in the setting of an intact prostate or we're kind of at the middle portion of the postoperative bed. And kind of another marker for where we end these obturator contours inferiorly is when the fat plane, this dark area between the obturator internus muscle and the prostate pretty much disappears. That's where we end our obturator lymph nodes. So let's see, we've covered a lot of ground in our hour and 16 minutes together so far, but there are a number of things that I did not discuss. And I just want to identify those, you know, one, we didn't talk about what to do in the setting of lymph node positive prostate cancer, how we contour that. We didn't talk about contouring the prostate in the setting of, or the prostate or lymph nodes in the setting of a ligamatostatic prostate cancer. We did not talk about palliative contouring in the cases of palliative radiation to the prostate. We focused on normal pelvic anatomy 
as I'm sure you all know, there can be so many variations in normal anatomy, whether it's colorectal variations, bladder issues, odd bony anatomy. We did not talk about that today. Now we did briefly discuss inclusion or exclusion of the seminal vesicles, but that wasn't something that we had planned on doing. This lecture is purely focused on contouring. We did not discuss PTV margins, nor did we discuss dose and fractionation for the various prostate disease sites. We did not discuss the utilization of image guidance or treatment planning systems preferences for, for what we use. And so, you know, we, we covered a lot of ground, but there's still so many other issues that are really germane and important when we're thinking about transitioning to CT-based IMRT for prostate cancer that, that you know, will be addressed in, in subsequent lectures. So with that, we'll, we've reached the end of my prepared content, and I'm happy to take questions from the group until our time is up in about 12 minutes. And I don't know if the easiest way is for just, it looks like we'll just keep the questions coming in and I'll try to read them out loud so that everybody knows what the question is. So let's see. If contouring the pelvic lymph nodes with the margins of one centimeter to three centimeters, the CTV protrude into the bladder, should it be corrected? So when contouring the pelvic lymph nodes, remember we use the, the arteries and veins, the common external and internal iliac arteries and veins as surrogates for the lymph node areas. And we have a, about a five to seven millimeter margin around those blood vessels, excluding bladder, bone, small and large intestines, muscle. So, so CTV nodes should not include normal organs at risk. So this is, so the next, the next question that I got was, what are the indications for covering pelvic lymph nodes? And this is certainly opening a can of worms as treating pelvic lymph nodes is quite controversial. I'll just briefly speak to my practice pattern. So for men with intermediate risk prostate cancer, I never treat pelvic lymph nodes. For almost all men with high risk prostate cancer, I do treat pelvic lymph nodes. For men with lymph node positive prostate cancer, either in the intact setting where they're not going to surgery, I'm, I treat their prostate and their pelvic lymph nodes, and I try to boost the involved, grossly involved lymph nodes to as high a dose as I can safely deliver. Usually it's the colon and more often the small bowel that limit the dose that I can get to the involved pelvic lymph nodes. In the setting of, and I think the controversy regarding whether or not to treat lymph nodes in the setting of high-risk prostate cancer, you know, that's, that's a fierce debate. Institutionally at MCW uh, or the Medical College of Wisconsin, we do treat the public lymph nodes. Other institutions like Harvard do not typically. The RTOG trial 0924 is a trial that's asking the question for men with unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer and high-risk prostate cancer all of them receive prostate radiation. All of them get a minimum of six months of um, androgen deprivation therapy, six months or three years. And the randomization is to prostate alone versus prostate and nodal treatment. I think we'll have much, a much clearer picture of whether or not nodal radiation is indicated in the setting of dose escalated prostate radiation with, with ADT. But for now, my practice pattern is to treat all high risk prostate cancer patients, treat their lymph nodes. In the setting of post-operative or salvage radiation therapy after prostatectomy, there's some strong data from the RTOG 0524 trial in which, or 0524, 0534, which suggests that men that receive salvage radiation therapy to their prostate bed and their pelvic lymph nodes and short course androgen deprivation therapy have better disease-free survival. So I do have a discussion in men with a detectable PSA of greater than 0.1, I, I do discuss not only short course androgen deprivation therapy with salvage radiation therapy to the prostate bed, but I also discuss lymph node treatment. 
But there are a lot of nuances to this question, so that's that's a good one. But a whole a whole lecture could be dedicated to discussing that. Any other questions that anybody has? Again, we we covered a lot of ground today, and you know certainly my slides will be a reference, and we'll be sending you a number of papers. Oh, so this, so I, uh, a question regarding gross nodes near colon or small bowel. So what margins do I use when there are gross nodes near colon or small bowel? That's really difficult. You know, if, if nodes are, are right approximate to, to bowel, you really can't get a, a lot of dose there. It's your, your organ at risk constraints that really limit or dictate the dose that you're able to get there. And I usually try to, you know, you, you need some margin because anatomy changes. But, you know, it's unrealistic to have huge margins that go into large bowel and small bowel. So it's really, I, I probably alter the margins a little less than I do the dose that I'm willing to tolerate that. So, so Dr. Khan asked, what constraints do I use for dose limiting? And this is something that maybe Dr. Puckett can discuss a little further on Tuesday. But, you know, typically my maximum point dose when delivering conventionally fractionated radiation therapy um, to the pelvis for small bowel is 0.03 cc dose of 55. And that is really extrapolated from the cervical cancer literature in treating the periortics and, and seeing small bowel toxicity at doses above 55. I really try to limit my maximum small bowel dose to lower than that, but 55 is my absolute ceiling. Well, are there any other questions that anybody has before we conclude today? Well, if not, you know, please feel free to send the Rios Contra Cancer group additional prostate contouring questions that can be addressed by Dr. Puckett on Tuesday, November 24th. It's been a pleasure to spend time with you all today, and I wish you all the best as you yeah, it's, and I wish you health and it's this uh, difficult time with the pandemic. So again, thank you all for your time today and have a good evening and stay well.